I can confirm that you are live. Thank you very much. So I am going to call this meeting to order as Point Pleasant Park Advisory Committee. And this is for Thursday, March 3rd, 2022. And uh, I'm gonna begin with uh, our land acknowledgement. The Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaty signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. And now we need a roll call. So if everybody can, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say the names and check reply, if, make sure your audio and video are working. So first, Alex. I'm here. This, Thank you. And Natasha. I am here. Are you here? There you are. And Harpreet. I yeah, I'm his. there. There you are. Carolyn. Here. Ben, there you are. Sandra Nolan. Yes, here. Perfect. And way I... Right here. I saw. There you are. Ah, nice leg. Brian. I'm here. Nice to see you. And Erin is absent, and we are aware that she would be. And I think Stephen still isn't here. Um, is that correct? Has anyone seen Stephen? Nope. So um, the last person would be Jill, other than me. I am here, and I believe uh, Stephen Rice is also in the meeting. Oh, fantastic. Yep, I'm here. Thank you very much, Stephen. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is elect a vice chair. Um, so we'll begin with call for nominations for the position of vice chair of the Point Pleasant Park Advisory Committee. So this requires a mover and a seconder for the nomination. Does anyone have anyone to move? No movers? Good. Everybody has to participate. We all have to take a chance to move things. Is true. I'll move something. Like <laughs> sure. I'll second her moving it. Yeah. Who uh, who 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 are we nominating here? Sorry, who are who are we nominating here? I lost Is track of we... what we we're doing. I think Carla, oh, because she we're... actually spoke, should be nominated. But I think we're still doing, aren't we doing adopting the, sorry, Mr. Chair, go ahead. I, no, I, I might have missed something here. Jill, you can let me know if I had. I think that we all introduced ourselves and then now we're talking about, you've introduced the topic on voting for vice chair, I believe. Vice chair. Okay. So then someone yep. has to like put up their hand to either nominate somebody and then someone needs to second that, I believe. And, and based on her excellent job <laughs> of just explaining that, can I nominate Carlin? Will she accept that? Because it can't be me. That would be wrong. Yeah, that's true. And no one else seems interested. So unless I'm reading the room wrong. Carlin, I, what do you think? If someone else is interested, please feel free to take it. If no one is interested, I will definitely do it. Sounds good. Okay, so <laughs> if there are no I'm more nominations, yeah. um, sorry, that was a seconder. Oh, I'll second it. Is that you are pre. Yeah. Okay, so I believe we now have a, a mover and a seconder for Carlin for vice chair. Um, and seeing as she is the only nominee, um, it's she is automatically seated. Again, Jill, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, but this would be uh, my chance to call for nominations to seats. Yes, yeah, so, so we can just get a mover and a seconder for the nominations to cease. Uh, Carolyn could be, will become the uh, vice chair. Elevated to vice chair. So do we have a mover for nominations to cease? I so move nominations to cease, Sandra. Sandra Boo's nomination to cease, and do we have a seconder? Brian seconds. Thank you, Brian. All right, so next 
point is the approval of min minutes from November 25th, 2021. And is, uh, had, did anyone notice any errors or omissions from last meeting? Looked pretty good to me. It was all pretty mm -hmm. straightforward last time through. Uh, um, so I'll we'll call for a motion to approve the minutes. And this again requires a mover and a seconder. Natasha moves. And, thank you. And do we have a seconder? I'll second. And call for the question. Oh, now we have now we have to actually uh, uh, approve the minutes. Is that right? And then, although, am I following this yeah. correctly? Yeah, just yeah. call for the question yeah, right. approval. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we call call uh, for a request for approval. So all those in favor say aye, and all those opposed say nay. Hey, Hold aye. on. Aye. Hey. Aye. Aye. Very good. And that sounds to me like the motion carries as presented. The next point is approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. So Jill, are there any additions or deletions? There are no additions or deletions from the municipal clerk's office. Thank you. Are there any members that would like to move items? Anyone want to add add an item, I guess? Uh, so, sorry. I'm raising my hand. Yes. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, it's a question because I don't know if it will end up in the Point Pleasant Park Operations update. Um, and that is in relation to the, um, the what you did in January May, a way, uh, looking at the erosion effect and climate change on the park. I was just, so I don't know if that's, but if it's not at some point, maybe somebody could touch on that. This was, so, yeah, something we, um, I know there's one thing we were gonna speak briefly on today or way mentioned it yesterday um, and how there's a, a lot of stone is coming up on, uh, on the lower trails. Um, I, I think there are sort of widespread issues of, of erosion. So it's, I, I, I agree, we got stuff to talk about there. Um, is, is there anything you wanted to add for this time around? I don't personally have anything to add. If it's part of the operations update today, then that's fine. That'll introduce the topic. If it's not, then it yeah. may need to be deferred to the next meeting. Okay. So Joe can clarify that for us. Maybe, Jill. I'm sorry. So um, I'm going to actually uh, defer to Stephen to see if that is something that uh, is going to be included. And if not, um, we can add that to next month's agenda if that would be um, if that would be okay with the committee. It, it sounds good to me. How, would that suit your purposes as well, Nat Natasha? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So that that works for for both parties. And do we need? Do you want to clarify that now? We'll just we'll uh, deal with it as it comes up. Um, Jill I, or if I could just ask, uh, Stephen, was this something that uh, was going to be part of the conversation today? Sorry, I've been talking away on mute here. <laughs> I didn't realize I had to physically unmute myself. Sorry. Um, I can speak to the erosion shoreline uh, issue briefly in the operations update. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can add that on to the update. That wouldn't be too difficult, I don't think. Great. Thank you, Stephen. And if I, if I may, if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, I think the intention of it would be a capital project two or three years from now, the money this year is to do studies and pub and and they, they were talking about coming to the committee. Right. So right, what right. I would ask, what I would ask the clerk to do would be 
to reach out to Jeff Spares, who's the uh, planner for uh, Park Capital uh, in Parks and Rec, and okay. and see whether or not next meeting they want to come, or it might be too early for them at this point. We haven't actually passed the budget yet that would enable this to happen. Gotcha. So it's really a future leaning any in in any case. Was was that clear to you, Jill? Yeah, for sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. That would that works works for me too. And um, Natasha. Yeah. Still still works for you. Yep. Okay. Good. So we can now. Uh, I'll call for a motion to approve the order of business. And this again requires a mover and a seconder. Uh, do we have a mover? I'll move, Brian. Thank you, Brian. And a seconder? Sandra. I, I second. Okay, we got, we got a bunch. Harpreet, Sandra, and I heard someone else as well, Carolyn. So we should be good yes, to go. Hi. So the. I'll call for the question now um, to, to um, sorry, I'll call, call again for a, all in favor, say aye, and all opposed say nay to the, the orders of business for this week. And if all those approving say aye. 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 And all those not approving say nay. No nays. Excellent. So that, will pass this motion carries as presented and then business next item is business arising out of the minutes so is there any business arising out of the minutes from last time now th this jill let me clarify will this be business as in like business business or just in any items you're not talking about fiscal fiscal business Uh, yeah, so uh, the business arising out of the minutes would be, yeah, if there was anything after you reviewed the minutes that had yeah. come up, so. Okay, I don't think any there, I don't think there was, and um, I don't seem to, to need um, a motion to pass beyond this point. It's usually then, broken up into old business, like so that would be anything from like last week that need to be okay. discussed. And then after that, I believe, and this is only based on Robert's rules of orders. So, but then you could go, is there anyone that ha has any new business to bring up? Gotcha, for this week. So is, is there anyone with old business or new business? that they would like to uh, bring up in regards to the minutes. I think there were, I don't think we dealt with much really conclusively last time in any case. So unless anyone has something they'd like to speak up, I'm gonna move along to number five, which is call for declaration of conflicts or interests. So does anyone have conflicts or interests that would, um, that they would uh, like to declare and avoid those parts of the meeting when we come to it. Okay, so I don't, no one spoke up, so I'll assume no one has any conflicts or interests. If you do, um, we ask you turn off your camera, mute yourselves while the item is being presented and discussed. And that's all. So the next item is consideration of deferred business. So this is, now we're getting into the meaty stuff. Um, so 6.1 is a discussion regarding the utilization of Point Pleasant Park's display cases to illustrate indigenous usage of the area pre and post contact. As every, everyone is familiar what we're talking about when, when I say dis display cases. Yep. They're, uh, yeah, they've been there for, uh, boy, at that decade now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, had, I had raised this point some time ago. Walking by them one day, I thought, well, they probably need a little revitalization for one thing. Uh, the other was that you know, we have a lot of story to tell. And the part of the story we weren't telling was about the indigenous heritage of the park. And was there some way we could research and create a display that would help share that? 
that was all. Yeah, and I think every everyone was uh, very supportive of that idea. Um, so Cheryl, um, Cheryl Copage Gehu, is that correct? Jihu. Jihu. Cheryl, um, nice to meet you. My name is Jake Dambergs. So Cheryl has been invited here um, to speak to this item specifically. And do you like to just go ahead, Cheryl? Sure. Um, I could probably could provide some context. Uh, so uh, I know that Pam was invited to attend as well as a representative for the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. And I'm sure all of you have seen before previously the Point Pleasant Park that uh, plan that was developed along with the indigenous community. Mm. So I think a lot that plan had some really great ideals and perspectives about what we could do to showcase our indigenous community within Point Pleasant Park. And, and that work was really done really collaboratively with youth elder uh, representatives from the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center with our Mi'kmaq archeologist, uh, Roger Lewis, and a couple of other people. So I think it might be important to revisit that plan. And that plan has even been referenced also within our Cornwallis Task Force report that we should go back and revisit that plan and look at implementing some of those items. What I would also kind of suggest that you make a connection with is we have a group called the Nova Scotia Culture Tripartite Forum which has representatives from the indigenous community who work very specifically on curating the Mi'kmaq history, especially within different areas. So they did a lot with the petroglyphs within, within the Bedford Barrens area. So they've done a lot of that work and other works throughout the, the province. And also we have a unit called KMKNO, which is our negotiation unit, but they have a team of archeologists on staff that have an elder advisory committee that advise them on the historical nature and things that you can profile these stories with. So I can most definitely share with you all this contact information, but I think it's very important that we connect with these groups. And, and, and to be quite honest, I think we really need to really build that relationship back up with the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center because they they had so much vested interest in the plan before and they were mm -hmm. very discouraged when a lot of the work didn't come to fruition. Now, Sh Cheryl, are you part of the Friendship Center? Uh, no, I'm actually no. a staff member for HRM. So I'm part of their oh, diversity great. and inclusion team. Oh, I see. You're on the, you're, you're actually uh, on that team. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming in sharing your time with us today. Um, so the, the original plan, I, I, if, if anyone hasn't um, looked at this yet, um, there was a plan developed for the park, sort of a long-term goal after, um, after one. And um, they spent quite a bit of money and I think a couple of years anyway, it was, a, a, I thought it was a, a decent plan. It seemed to really look to, as Cheryl was saying, um, the, the true history of the park and sort of trying to highlight um, how it was used before colonialism. Um, so in, Cheryl, as, as far as you're aware, um, the organizations that you mentioned, the Culture Tripartite and um, KL came, came in, came out, yeah. um, are, are they, would they be in favor of still following the existing plan that was as it was laid out or have things changed? To, to be honest, I don't think either of those groups have seen the plan because that was a okay. work that was led by the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center. Ah, I see what you're saying. Okay, so we, we should really bring, bring this through to them. And I see we have lots of hands up. I think Tracy, Tracy oh, was wonderful. actually, Tracy Jones Grant was actually part of the work at that time as well. So she might want to Hi, add Tracy. a little bit more contacts into it. Yes, Tracy, please go ahead. Hello, Mr. Chair and, and good Hi. evening committee members. I'm Tracy Jones Grant. I'm the managing director for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotian Affairs within the municipality. Um, actually wasn't part of that original plan development, but when our office was created, we were brought in to have some conversations about that plan. I just want to um, reiterate something that Cheryl said that I think is more of a starting point to get us moving forward to engage the Indigenous community. As Cheryl had said, the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center was heavily involved, helped bring the right people around the table to write that original plan. And right now they're feeling disconnected 
and they're feeling like we haven't listened. We've had this plan for a long time, but we haven't actioned it. So I think, um, Mr. Chair, perhaps you and maybe you, Councillor Mason, could set up an individual meeting. And I know we don't have meetings outside of committee, but at least a conversation with the executive director to get guidance from her as to how she sees us moving forward. It's great to reach out to a lot of the other organizations, but because we started with the Friendship Center, I think if we're going to do anything moving forward, it's really kind of, um, I, I don't want to say proper protocol, but most respectful to go back yeah, to where yeah. we started. So yeah. that I just wanted to sort of pop in before we got into other questions to kind of reiterate what Cheryl was saying, the importance of going back. It is referenced in the Cornwallis Task Force. And yeah. so going back to where we started might help us move that along. Thank I, you. I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm entirely on board yeah, taking that on by myself or, or with some help. Um, okay. Who would be the next? Is anyone paying attention to the hands? They don't have orders on them. Um, Might have been Wade. Yeah, What's that? Might have been Wade. Might have been Wade. Yep. All right, Wade, your turn. Uh, so, how I got a copy of the 2008 draft report is that Pam uh, de Rocher, who runs the Friendship Center, gave it to me the first time I met her and talked quite frustratedly about how it had been delayed. Uh, so that's boy. how I got a yeah. copy. And uh, I think at this point, like so many things, uh, you know, like we've talked and talked and talked around it. So I, I think re-engaging with Friendship Center is very important. I also think a note to, to staff and they're gonna laugh when I say this because they know none of us have the direct power. It's like, like we need to somehow have a conversation here and then up through the whole process that this has budget and is a priority because we people aren't gonna wanna talk to us about talking again, basically. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great plan and, and I yeah. totally support it. And as late as when Rendezvous Canada was coming here the summer that the convention center opened, the Friendship Center and some other folks in the Mi'kmaq community were talking about trying to get a lot, the longhouse in that plan built. Oh, nice, yeah. and Making that a big part of like indigenous tourism here in Halifax yep. and Nova Scotia yeah. and Mi'kmaq. And, and so it, it's, I don't think it's a out of date uh, document that needs updating in the minds of a lot of the folks that worked on it. I think they think it just Good. needs to be done, so. That's promising, thank that. you, eh? Yeah. yeah. Um, Alex Smith. Yeah, likewise, I think it's a great idea if we can pursue this and, and it's good to hear a little bit of the background. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about is what authority as a committee do we have to pursue this? And I think Wei was touching on that a little bit and uh, he could perhaps, uh, you know, uh, go a little broader on that from his perspective uh, on council, because I think the last thing that we would want to do is start an engagement mm. and then have to pull back. Yeah, have, have the same result the second time. Been some, yes, there's already been yeah. some disappointment around this. Yeah. So I think we got to get things lined up mm -hmm. so uh, we can proceed with it and make sure it's a success. Right. That's a very good point, Alex. So, Way, is there any, is that something you, you want to chew on or can you answer very quickly? Is there a well, route well, to... Well, my, to very, my very quick thought on that is it needs to be staff-led because it needs to be Cheryl and, and uh, uh, Tracy and a consistent contact. And I think okay. the role of the committee, the way it was put at one point is uh, the, the role of the committee is that Halifax Regional Council and Halifax West Community Council are asking you for... Uh, parent uh, for uh, child rearing advice, right? It's like, it's our baby, the Point right. Pleasant Park is, our, is, is our, our responsibility, but we wanna know yeah. what you think should happen. And I think that your input into, like when it comes down to changing the park and working to decolonize and, and accept the entire history of the park, which is something that's in the Point Pleasant Park master plan going back to one, that's mm -hmm. why the 2008 yeah. plan came. All of this is within your remit, but we wanna hear from the public about that and and you're the primary representative of that to to, to you know help 
uh, not to say whether it should happen, but to talk about how it should happen. Gotcha. Okay, so I, if, unless there's any more hands, sorry, Tracy, is your hand up again or, yes, please go ahead, yeah. Um, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Mason, are you suggesting that perhaps, say Cheryl and I meet with Parks or whomever's, it, are we looking at bringing a staff report back to the Point Pleasant Park Committee? Is that kind of the direction or is this not as formal? I don't, I'm used to working with council so that the request comes in a motion and then we do a staff report. We should probably all chat and come back to the okay. committee next, next month. And then okay. the way it would work is the committee, and this is good learning for all the new committee members, would recommend that Halifax and West Community Council request a staff report, which it may okay. or may not do. And it, so Cheryl and I will follow up with you, <laughs> Councillor Mason, then. Thank okay, you. Perfect. That's great, great clarification. Great. Thank you. Good, good Thank clarification. Thank you, all three of you. Yeah. Oh, that, that makes me happy. I hope Brian is as well. We're getting some movement on this one. That's great. Um, yeah. So has everybody spoken to this who would like to speak to this? My, I've messed my page order up here. Speaker list this, is it. This Sorry, is a yeah. project. You had mentioned that um, you were very interested in, in doing this, and I support that. And so if there's any help needed with this, I... I'm definitely in, um, I have a background volunteering with the Friendship Center as well as working alongside some of the grassroots grandmothers. Great. So I definitely believe in this project. Good, sounds like we have a good group to go after Oops. it. So yeah, um, no other hands up. Harpreet, is there anything you wanted to slide in? No, we might be away for a sec. Sandra? Yeah, actually, I was oh, just sorry. listening to, yeah, I'm just listening to you guys. Like, it's my first time volunteering with, the, with this committee. Yeah. So I'm not, like, used to this stuff, but, like, I'm, like, learning new stuff, you know? Like, yeah. You know what I mean? No. I, I am yeah, as well, yeah. 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 No, no yeah, worries. So, yeah, so I'm just, like, um, grabbing more knowledge about it. So, yeah. yeah. So have you heard of um, the, the park plan we're talking about? Have you heard of yeah. this before? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So was there anything you wanted to add to? Did you, you followed what we were, um, they're gonna have uh, Way and Cheryl and Tracy, you're gonna have a meeting outside and figure out how to actually present it to council so we might get it done. Is there anything else you'd want to add to the discussion? Um, <laughs> Um, like, not pretty much, but yeah, I want to do more research on it. Like, want to like go more deep on it. Like, it's certainly something we're going to come back to. Yeah, it's yeah, not going to yeah, get done not, in a hurry, okay, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Yeah, I was time. yeah. Okay. Good. Um, Sandra, was there anything you would like to? No, I'm nothing to add to this, but I'm, I'm just following what you're doing with great interest and um, we'll look forward to see its execution. That's all I have to say. Wonderful. Um, Way, you're good, I'm guessing. Yeah, Brian. Good to go, Alex. Good, Natasha. Good, and Aaron's not here. All right, so that is going to conclude 6.1. Now, 6.2. I'm going to just leave. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank nice you very meeting. much. Great meeting yeah. you all. Yeah, we'll, we'll speak to you in the future as well. Thank you. Um, this, Jill, I'm going to ask for some um, advice here. So this is an item I brought last time. Um, I, I can just stay silent. I'm, I'm not sure what would be the proper protocol or should I? Should we uh, temporarily? Um, if you would like to enter into the debate, generally we would ask that the vice chair take over the chair position. 
Sounds um, good. Provided that uh, that is acceptable to the vice chair. Vice chair, how, I'm with how me. will you rule? On um, yep. I just need to know what we're going to be. Like, I don't have any notes other than the agenda that was sent, right? Yeah, this was, it, it was basically me noticing um, fires occurring regularly in a few spots and trying to figure out how we can, um, how we can deal with it. It's, uh, uh, I, I can sort of, I'll clear it up quickly. It's, it seems ridiculous getting the fire department in there half the time. They have to in full gear, go through the woods, you know, down through trails um, to get fires out. And I, I think a, a lot of it m might be able to be avoided just by uh, getting rid of the, the fire pits as soon as they appear, um, or maybe more signage, I'm not sure. But that's really as far as we got on this item. So Stephen was going to speak to it this time, and that was it. And then just run through and see if anyone else has anything to, to put in. So it, I, I'll, I'll formally um, pass on the chair to you. Vice Chair and um, Stephen, did you want to start this one off, or would you like me to dig into it a well, bit more? I mean, yeah, I think I've got your original email here from a while back, back in the fall, I believe. Um, yeah. And yeah, it came to me as a service request through three one one, and I don't know if we chatted on it or I think we just emailed back and forth a couple times. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, I mean, there's not much I can say in terms of an active fire. Like if there's a fire in the park, you know, same thing I would tell my guys is, is call 311 and get the fire department down here for an active fire. I mean, my mm -hmm. staff, I mean, we've got, um, you know, uh, fire extinguishers on the vehicles and we have stopped and put out little spot fires in the past. Same thing as if, yeah. you know, uh, one of our machine catches on fire, we'll jump out yeah. and put it out, or if there was a spot fire. But, you know, anybody having an active fire in the park, we want to get enforcement. We want to get uh, fire department in ASAP. Um, you know, other than that, I, not much else I can say other call, call, call emergency. I'd call 911 if there was a fire. And, uh, you know, our staff will go in afterwards and clean something up. Same thing as if there was a, if there was a squatter site or somebody, you know, camping in yeah. here overnight and left a bunch of junk. I mean, we will go in and clean it up afterwards, but our staff are pretty, pretty limited on what they can do enforce. Uh, well, there's really no enforcement that, that my staff can do. Yeah. Uh, so signage there are, I mean, there's, there's icons on the entrance signs, which say no fires and, and the kiosks themselves say no fires, but I don't know. You guys can debate what more more signage is going to going to defer somebody from having a fire in the park. I mean, if somebody's coming in to have a fire, I don't think a sign is going to. No, it's it, very much. I, I I would agree with you. I it's the people that are doing it know they shouldn't be doing it. And they're doing it anyway. Um, but the the problem I run into is um, we've been told by the fire department basically if we ever see the park on fire, like well on fire, to get out of our house because we're going to lose it. Um, and they've been, more than once I've been told this over the past decade. Um, what, when I get them down here, I have to, the problem is I have to notice it. So basically I have to be on patrol um, every night in the spring, fall and summer and walk down through these areas to see if someone has an active fire going or put my drone up and, you know, find the smoke trails that have been, that's how I've been dealing with them recently. Um, but I was, I had a really scary situation where a group of people surrounded me um, and I felt pretty lucky to get out of there, um, you know, in one piece. Um, they didn't want me to them to put out their fire, you know, and they didn't, didn't care that they shouldn't be having it there. Um, so I agree. I don't see signage doing much. Fire departments say they have nothing, they have no um, protocol um, to deal with this specifically, I think is the way they put it to me, or they have no program in place. Um, clean, cleaning them up would be a, a place to start anyway, Stephen. Um, how do we get, how do we connect with um, staff, park staff, so that they know like there's, there was one of them that was actually quite high up um, about a month ago 
Um, it was in front of one of the benches that's, um, it's facing the arm, but it's, it's up on, you know, the third level trail. I don't know my trail names, I'm sorry. Um, but it's, you know, somewhere where it's quite obvious, but it was there for a couple of weeks, like a big pile of, of charcoal, which anyone that's walking by it puts an idea in their head, right? And it's much easier to light on fire. So how, how do we, um, what would be a good way to get this information through to um, people that can clean it up? So I can uh, speak a little bit to that. Sure, Chris. So the, I mean, the best way to get information to park staff for cleanup after the fact on something like that is through 311. And a service request will get generated and it'll go to park supervisor and it'll filter down to the staff to get action. Um, anytime that there's an active fire or somebody in there burning something in a campsite or, or anything, that, that call has to go to bylaw or police to be enforced. Um, it shouldn't come to park staff. We're not in a position to enforce any laws down there and we're not in a position to lay fines. So yeah. those, those issues have to go to somebody that can do that and, uh, and do that effectively. Now, if you phone in through 311 and ask to be connected to a bylaw, that should be a fairly quick connection and they should be able to action that almost immediately. Yeah, the problem is um, response time from bylaw is, you know, days. So it's pretty much useless in terms of this. Police and fire, I was doing 311 for ages. Um, I started calling 911 again because I saw it last year, no, sorry, two years ago, fire reported that they only had two reports of fire in the park for the whole year. This would have been 2019, which I, I is just absurd. Um, someone that lives next to the park, there's fires in there pretty much every night. But so this, I mean, where you're leading is the same. The, the only way we're going to fix it for real is if someone is enforcing the bylaw. I don't know how to get that happen. Um, that happening again, but. Um, yeah, it may be a matter of having to phone HRP to assist to uh, get somebody that's having a fire in their address. Yeah, well, um, maybe you can tell me how what I should be telling them because all they do is they send me to uh, dispatch sends out fire or uh, whoever I get um, on non emergency puts it to fire and they come and they again they can't they're very polite to the people most of the time which is great you know they're not in enforcement officers either but um, how do I get something like that to police or someone that's going to come down while the fire is going. Well, if there's an active fire, then it, I would phone it in through 911. It's an emergency. Yeah, that's, okay, so now we're back to square one. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically chasing my tail here. So that leaves me in the position where I need to be patrolling the park every night. Otherwise, who knows if there's a fire? And if there is, then I got to try and chase someone down to go in. And Which is, I mean, I it, it's not that I mind doing it, but it's a safety thing and it you know, I kind of do. We got elderly neighbors as well. A lot of them wouldn't get out of their houses in time. I'm pretty much guarantee you. Um, I, I, I don't feel like we're, we've sort of gotten <laughs> anywhere here, made any progress. So maybe, does anyone have any suggestions? Maybe how, uh, sorry, I see, oh, I see two hands up. Natasha? Um, yeah, well, I guess it's a question for either and or Steve and Chris. Um, does the city have a fire prevention plan for parks? And if so, is this park employing the full extent of those measures already? Sure, I guess the fire prevention plan is there's no fires allowed, period. And it's signed on all the entrances. Um, you know, that's that's a vote as flat as you can I get. I don't think there's a sign on our entrance. So that's the extent of fire prevention plan in this. Sorry, somebody's making a lot of noise with paper. Yeah, um, paper? <laughs> um, 
so that's the extent that the city has for fire prevention of its uh, wooded properties or any property for that matter, the outdoor property, green space. I, all I know is when, when I asked Halifax Fire about it, they, they said no, there are no specific plans yet. Like fires are not supposed to be, they shouldn't have out, out, uh, open fires in the city, period. Right? It's not even the park per se. So what they told me is they have nothing special for fires in Point Pleasant Park kind of thing. Uh, we should, you know, deal with it like anything else. But the problem is I can't be out there constantly no. patrolling the park. So, no. and I don't want to be. No. Um, I'm, Natasha, can we pop up to Way? Is that okay? Way? Yes. You have something you can help us I, with? I think this, I think this is the kind of thing where the committee uh, could uh, make a motion um, uh, and I don't have anything worded. And so we might want to think about it and do it next meeting. Uh, okay. But we may want to make a motion to request that help as a community council, uh, you know, request staff uh, to something, right? That's where it breaks down is I don't know what to ask them yet. Right. But, exactly. uh, but you know, and you don't want to wait for a big long staff report, but, but I think, no. uh, you know, what, what I really, you know, what I really originally plugged in to say is uh, uh, I think part of what we're seeing is definitely a function of uh, COVID exhaustion and fatigue and anger, right? Like people are just like, I don't care yeah. about your rules. I'm going to do what I want. I, I can't go downtown. I'm going to go to the park and start a fire. So I think things are worse than ever. And it also is crossing into nexus with the uh, housing crisis, right? Yeah. So definitely we yeah. see people who are starting fires to keep warm. And so in the summer, the park yeah. can be extremely dry and, and it's, you know, not to be a uh, doomsayer or anything, but the fire folks ha are worried, not just about the park in your neighborhood, but if no, you get right. a treetop to treetop fire going on the peninsula, yeah. you could have forest fire that goes all the way to Needham. So yeah, we're down the, it's down really the rail important for that, to yeah. not have that happen, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, I, you know, the kind of thing that we've talked about in the past is, it's funny because this actually lines up with the defund conversation we're having is bring back park patrol, have more bylaw enforcement on the weekend, make it so the response time is faster. Any bylaw right. enforcement. So which any, is any, any would yeah, be a benefit, any. benefit in the park. Yeah. We lost I lost Way's voice. Sorry, uh, that, oh, this is go. something I've been hearing from the committee the whole 10 years that I've been here. When I first got elected in 2012, they'd just gotten rid of park patrol in the last yeah half decade and people were lamenting it so who remember yeah that, right so it, and in so other this is the kind of thing well, you can right? recommend yeah it, yeah it, for sure it, it, yeah it's okay good okay um well i'm i'm happy to spend some of my time trying to um uh, figure out how to word that properly sorry i see another hand there alex please go ahead yeah, I, I, i'm just wondering if you've been able to uncover anything around enforcement uh, has there ever been anybody charged with having a fire in Point Pleasant Park? Has anybody ever been fined? Uh, is that a deterrent? Now, that might not be the case for all people, because I think we do have to be, you know, conscious, aware of people are, are using that space. Homeless people are using that space at night to sleep and keep warm. It's different than uh, a group of teenagers coming down and, and having a party, even yeah, though and it's it the same effect, right? Yeah. It's, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be complaining if it was honestly. If it was people that were just trying to stay warm, I would have yeah. no. It's. It's not. It's no, no. kids drinking. So yeah, and and it's not worth the risk. And and then I. I, I how do how do we uh, how do we package it? What is the context? I mean, you've said both times that we've spoken about this. You've referenced your elderly neighbors who would not yeah. be able to get out of the house quite possibly in time if there were a fire. Yeah. So. Isn't a fire in uh, in an area like Point Pleasant much more dangerous, perhaps, than than any other park in town? So could, can't we can't we put it in that kind of context that there yeah. is some value to ensuring the safety of, of this place? I, I'm sure you've thought of all these things before. You're living right beside it, right? So 
Yeah, but they it's it's easy to get tunnel vision as well, being this close to it. So I appreciate. No, I think that those are a couple of really good suggestions um, to chase after anything historical. Yeah, and then how to how to frame it in compared to other perks, or you know maybe it's something other areas are going to want to jump on board because they need it as well. Brian, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. You know, when we're framing it, I think what we can do is look at the models that exist in provincial and uh, federal parks. And again, we can't expect our day-to-day -day staff to enforce this because what they use are people with far greater powers, actually powers of arrest in some cases, yeah. and certainly the power to levy fines. And that may that just may be a part of our discussion. That's all. Yep, that's excellent. Thank you, Brian. So if, um, uh, oh, I was sorry. just going to yeah. say, sorry, I didn't put up my hand. That's okay. Um, and also, sorry about the long link in the chat, but I found in 2014, there was a fire behind that did a little bit of damage to Shakespeare by the Sea. Right. And then also, um, I just looked up, so National Parks of Canada Fire Protection Regulations. Um, I've, and but I don't see anything specific for like Nova Scotia, but um, yeah. So there are a couple little things like that that we could do. And I was wondering if, and this would probably have to be a way you could advise us on this possibly, but could we have like, what's it called? You know, like a na night neighborhood, you know how they used to do like neighborhood walks for like, and that, yeah, but if there was a yeah. spring, summer, uh, Point Pleasant Park Fire Prevention Club or something like that, you know, where people went in shifts, like maybe every Thursday night from eight until nine, I was there or something. But now that I'm suggesting that, I don't know how, how awesome an idea that is. Yeah, this, hey. it, the, the, the um, encounter I had that scared me was it was, I don't get scared easy. And I don't like, I've been in lots of dust ups when I was a kid. It was, I wouldn't have suggested anyone go down there other than police. So it was that, that's where the problem ends up being is there's no way for us to enforce it. We could sit down there and ask them not to, but as Wei said, I think people are getting tired of stuff. And, you know, if I mentioned to someone that, you know, Sailor's Memorial Way is not supposed to have dogs on it in the day, and, you know, people just look at me like, yeah, so it's not, you know, they're not talking about my dog. Um, Harpreet, you have something you'd like to add? So, yeah, I'm just following up with the conversation. And I would say, like, uh, the other reason for the fire could be smoking, maybe, I would say. So maybe, like, we can... Yeah, it's a do, like, danger, no too. smoking like no smoking in the park, like maybe like put more signs, like there should be no smoking in the park, like, right, or? It, that's actually a good idea because one thing it would do when people smell smoke, they would know it's not supposed to be there rather than, um, you know, assuming it's acceptable. But um, way maybe you can clarify this for me. I, as far as I know, smoking, by bylaws is now not allowed anywhere in HRM. Is right. that correct? Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. You, you got to be in, in your basement, <laughs> hiding from society. It's some yeah. change. Um, uh, the other thing, like, we can, like, point a staff maybe so, like, they can keep an eye on that area, like, uh, if, like, we can do. Is it possible to do like with HRM, like if they can point and stuff like in the nighttime, like they can keep an eye, like if there is any smoke around the area. And, yeah, that's uh, that's something that used to exist. There used to be a paid park patrol, and their job was to patrol the parks and you know catch kids drinking on the weekend. That was never me when I was growing up, of course. But um, 
Th- I was going to say, yeah. I swear they used to have people patrolling the park. <laughs> yeah, they, they used to hide up the trails with their lights off. And then when people would walk by with their beer, they'd flip on. Yeah, but, um, they, had a little so that white, was, they had a little white Wrangler, like Ford, like a little little pickup yeah. truck. And it had a yeah. bright spotlight that the driver yeah. could aim at the kids. It was That's very it. like Dukes of Hazard, you know? Yeah. And just be one guy in a yeah, whole pile of kids. But and is there anything else, Harpreet? Uh, yeah, no, thank uh, I would say, yeah, it's that's it. I want to talk about uh, good. Uh, if anything comes in my mind, I would definitely share with you. Thank you. Yeah, Alex or Brian or yeah, Natasha, just, I don't know who went up first. Just, just quickly for this one, yeah. it is uh, coming at it from a completely different perspective. Yeah, is there good a place this. where there can be? a designated fire right. pit and this if you want to have a fire this at point pleasant this is where you go and if you have a fire elsewhere then there will be some kind of serious repercussion in yeah. terms of enforcement and I, and i don't know if that's doable but it's it, is that something to think about um we we briefly touched on this before. I don't remember what the answer was. Wade, do you remember why the barbecues were taken or they just, did they just Stephen, fall into disrepair? Stephen, no, they, well, they fell into the sea, but I think they were, they were oh, yeah, right. before that. So, so St- I used to come over, sorry, I just have to say like one of my earliest memories in the seventies is coming over from Dartmouth with my family and doing a, you know, uh, barbecue with the charcoal hot, hot briquettes and all, yeah, all that's gone right but but steven i, I think uh knows knows about uh, uh the decisions around that yeah um so hrm slowly got rid of a bunch of fire pits over the last 10 to 12 years however there's a growing demand for families and uh people to get together and we've been having problems in in not only point pleasant park but several other parks with especially coals people coming down and having coal mm. fired barbecues and dumping the you know dumping the embers in a garbage can and melting it so mm. this summer there's going to be a trial actually there's some uh, they're like the bear proof uh garbage containers you'd see out west but um they're for hot coals so you're actually going to see a couple of these being trialed in sir sanford fleming Oh, okay. So oh, great. We've, uh, we've, yeah, we've, we've had more problems over there than, than in any park yeah, with uh, no, coal yeah. dumping. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're over there this spring, you should see two or three in place and we're going to trial them and see how they work and see how much trouble they are for staff to manage. And uh, so going forward. Yeah. If, I mean, if everything goes well with those, there's an opportunity maybe to put some uh, back down on the shore here. Yeah. Good. Well, that sounds promising anyway. Um, Brian? Just a little background. I was on the board for Shakespeare by the Sea. That fire was a, a structural fire. You know, what was the old restaurant down the headquarters? But if you, anyone is interested, about three years ago, the deputy fire chief came in and did a presentation to this committee. And it was very interesting. And I guess there's a consolation. He did say it would take an awful lot to get a bad forest fire going because there's not that much yeah. wooded material anymore. That's all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. And Natasha. Um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of second what Alex said. I think I brought that up at another, another meeting. And um, I think that was part of my question too about is there a fire project? So as long as we understand, I guess, I guess I'll explicitly state it now and see if this is true, that the fire pits were not removed due to some sort of ban like a ban of fires um it's not a part of like a a greater city plan of preventing fires and if that is the case then to me that seems like the natural one of the natural steps to so that we're not just taking prohibitive uh approaches we're taking supportive approaches as well and and i'm just thinking like this park needs to think future and with the target, the population target goals of density that are set for this city right now, and people living in 500 square meters in towers, uh, coming from international backgrounds, these are the people <laughs> yeah. that want to have fires in parks with their 
20 people or, or, you know, five, six, seven, 10 people, like so groups of people. So it's coming. <laughs> so yeah. we might as well plan for it now and, and have these sort of tests like you're suggesting uh, at Fleming and have these test sites here because this is the park that's going to support the densest population of all of Nova Scotia. And um, yeah. I just think, and then so, and I just kind of don't, I feel like this is opening up something bigger than just these one-off fires. Like to me, I'm just, I'm kind of shocked, I guess, that the only sort of prevention approach is the bylaw and a call from a citizen for enforcement. And so I just kind of want to flag that for us to sort of think about over time about what is the fire prevention approach to such a large swath of of uh, vegetation. I can probably speak to a little bit of that. Um, in terms of emergency management, um, you know, police and fire. If there were ever, if there ever were a fire, let's go to the to the to the second end of this scenario. I guess if there ever was a, a serious fire in here and it had to be evacuated. I mean, that would definitely fall to police and fire to uh, to go in and coordinate. Uh, you know, evacuating the park, evacuating the homes, and all that. On the front end of that scenario, in terms of is the is is the park a tinderbox? Is it ready to go up? I walked the park three years ago before we started this um, forestry thinning project with the uh, provincial forest health officer. She works at a Waverly and she goes all over the province. She does consulting for uh, various communities, communities, especially like uh, Hammond's Plains, stuff that a lot of um, crown land abuts. So they have a lot of forest fire management plans done for communities there is actually one done for right. hammond's plains there's there's several done around uh the outskirts of hrm and uh, i called her to get her to come down and walk the park with me to kind of put the same parameters onto everything in here like you know what what kind of you know old growth do we have young growth you know how thin is it what's on the ground so she looked at a bunch of parameters you know they they get into some technical stuff like fine fuel moisture code and uh you know the the eco type etc cetera, etc cetera. and i mean at that time she said down here there's really no concern of a fire here because the, the forest is a fairly young forest i mean most of it blew down in Juan, mm. and uh the thinning project we're doing is is kind of helping that as well so we don't have an official plan like none of this was documented but she said every year or two you know if conditions change you want you want to get her involved she'll certainly come down and walk the park and make an assessment of yeah you got too much stuff lying on the floor maybe you want to bring in some kind of a, a mulcher and get rid of some of that stuff but but I mean at the time you know uh, you know the park the park is in good shape most of the stuff we do like every time we get a tree come down mm -hmm. the guys will uh, you, you know the, the the method is to get everything on the ground so if we on get a tree ground, down yeah, I mean yeah. We want to get it flat to the ground. We want to, we want to get it bucked. We want to get the limbs flat. Once it's on the ground, then it's gonna you know it's gonna soak up more moisture and it's gonna it's gonna rot faster. So yeah. that's typically how we manage brush in here. And um, yeah, I mean, if there was ever anything that was that was going to be a fire hazard, I mean, we'd certainly try to try to deal with that as soon as possible. But I mean, as of as of two years ago or three years ago, I think it was when we walked it, she wasn't too current concerned about it at that time. Okay, that was quite recent then. Good. Well, that all that takes a little bit of the worry off the of, off of my head. Um, thank you, Stephen. Carlin. I was just going to say, um, I'm thinking, or my takeaway right now is that this might be two separate issues: one, um, fire prevention and control in Point Pleasant Park, and then two. Um, I was like fire friendly activities in Point Pleasant. Not, yeah. not that that's what, but you know, um, and then something that, and so I thought if maybe we separate them, we might be able to get to uh, a solution um, with a bit ease. And then the other thing is in other big cities, like uh, I've been to their parks and they have what we used to have, those little metal things. It, 
that you could barbecue in versus say a, a pit. So do we still have, we don't have those at Point Pleasant anymore, no. So there, so I'm suggesting what if um, in regards to the fire friendly activity part, if we put out more, we select the areas um, so that people have access to do the do a fire or barbecue in that and the social activities, but it's in a particular area and it's a particular quality. I, I think that fits with, with uh, the direction we were heading with, with, uh, with the other items here. Um, I don't think, yeah, I think that's, that's good input, Carolyn, thank you. It might be worth separating it out because the enforcement part is, I don't, that's the part I don't think we're going to get much traction on, not in a hurry anyway. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens in the, at the dingle there. And if that actually, because that's a pretty regular in, in the summer, there's always party, birthday parties or, you know, whatever there with people, people with open coals. Um, we have any other Harpre? Is your hand up again, or just forgot to take it down? I was just going to say something very quickly. the The fires that you're seeing from your place and that you're you're going out and you're checking on, they're not that. Uh, I don't get the sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're not mm -hmm. those kind of fires that people would put in little. Uh, in the little barbecue things for doing their hot dogs and their hamburgers. I don't think that's what those people are interested in, right? It's more like a beach oh, fire or a yeah. bonfire. That's, yeah. that's, that's the kind of fires that, uh, and, yeah. and, and I don't know that, that this idea that is going to be introduced at, uh, uh, over by the, the dingle this, this summer will respond to that i think it's a good yeah. idea to introduce yeah. those and give people that option but i think the others are still going to want to have those bonfires right oh yeah I, I i totally agree with that i think it's they're two two entirely separate groups of people but i mean it's yeah i gotta say 50 percent of the time when if it's just me you know and say you're not supposed to have a fire in the park and i have my pitchfork and i throw it in the ocean on it's small you know it's like three logs the ones that scare me are the ones that I find afterwards that are back further in the trees. So they're not just right on the shore and they were yeah. big, like they were putting everything, like you're saying, a bonfire. And then all of a sudden it's, that's, you know, they wouldn't be doing that down at the, the barbecue pits anyway. Right. Any other hands? Well, I'm, I appreciate all the, uh, the discussion and all the input. Um, I think um, I'd like to revisit um, some of the the suggestions people brought up. Um, I think we we can just move on to the next item. Is that right, Jill? You take back the chair. Sure. Oh, right. Thank you, Brian. So. I need to, is there a formal process to that or we'll just put it on the books that? No, we'll just have I'm, the uh, the minutes reflect that uh, you took the chair back. Okay, very good, thank you. So seven correspondence petitions and delegations. So Jill, is there any correspondence received by the clerk's office? We received no correspondence for this meeting. Okay, and petitions, Jill and committee members, are there any petitions anyone would like to bring forward? The municipal clerk's office did not receive any petitions. Okay. Um, so information item is brought forward. Oh, that would be if there was anything. So we have none. Uh, so the next item, the reports, discussions. Um, so this is the this is an opportunity for Stephen to speak um, 
speak to, or I guess answer questions? Is that is that the the intent here? Sure, I'm not uh, I'm not sure. I will defer to Stephen if he has anything that he would like to speak to up front, and then uh, yeah, if there's any questions from the committee. Oh, I see. This is I see. This is staff that would be making the report, and then I get it. Um, so, Stephen, is there anything you wanted to bring forward? Is this 9.1.1 we're at now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. This is, uh, this is the operations update, the memorandum that I typically would uh, submit for every meeting. Great. And I see the minutes of the last meeting. I wasn't at it. And I believe you deferred the last memorandum, which was dated November 4th, to this meeting. So do you want me to speak to that old memorandum first before I give any new information? Sure. Yeah, that would be great, thanks. Okay, um, so back in the fall, it was just a brief update on some of the projects that we had completed last summer. Um, you know, everybody says COVID did this and COVID did that. I mean, it definitely, <laughs> it definitely slowed us down on, uh, on a lot of things. I mean, for us, even getting rental vehicles was, was a nightmare and, hmm. you know, c contractors were, were hard to get at times, but, um, a few little projects that got done. Everybody noticed the upper parking lot, the Tower Road parking lot had the stone wall removed and uh, post and wire was put in and then post and wire was removed. And uh, so it's sitting right now with no wall, but the intention is this spring is to put the cable and post back. Um, it was just a deficiency when it was installed that they weren't, they weren't put in correctly. They were too loose. So uh the onus is on the contractor to come back and fix that. So it will look like the post and wire like it was before. And uh, a few drainage repairs were done. You'll notice at the bottom of Tower Hill, anybody familiar with the park um, and Ogilvy Road, we dug up a few old culverts, put in some new ones, improved mm -hmm. improved drainage, gives us less, uh, less washouts in the winter. And um, going forward this year, we're hoping to do another one on Prince of Wales, just before you get to the intersection with Heather, there's one of those triangular grates that's sitting about four inches too high to catch the water. So we're hoping to dig that whole roadway up and put in a couple of new culverts and redirect the water there. We had a washout several winters ago going down Prince of Wales. We had to shut the whole road down for about a week to fix it. So that hmm. drain is uh, that drain is one of the most important uh, catch basins in the whole park right there. Interesting. And there was an update on the signage. I know it was over a year ago, well over a year ago, we, we circulated the signage plan to the committee for review. And essentially we were um, getting rid of the old and bringing everything into the new design standards, new HRM uh, logo and same color schemes. So quite a few have been replaced. There's still quite a few to be done. I would say we're probably 50 to 75% range done. Uh, guys last week just finished the um, Sailor's Memorial Way, the no dogs after 10 section. So we had a request from uh, bylaw services to kind of button that up. There were a few little trails coming off that people were getting to and saying, oh, I didn't see a sign or I didn't know. So we literally have every entrance and every side entrance and every trail entering that area now, uh, well signed with a new sign saying no dogs after 10. So uh, majority of that's done. However, uh, there's still a few more smaller ones to be done this spring. And um, all the entrances now have a have a, an etiquette signage for, for dog use. Not ours. Oh no? No, no. <laughs> Believe me, I, I, yeah, I've been waiting eagerly, and it would be great to get it. But that's the one off the chain rock, right? That that's it. Yeah, I I even saw him out there with it one day. Um, gonna put it on the pole with the baggies and ran into some kind of problem. I don't know what it was, and yeah, took it away. <laughs> it was there. Was so supposed cold. to be one there. It was supposed to be mm -hmm. two, two coming off of Franklin, two coming off of Franklin, and then one coming off of Chain Rock. Those three, yeah. three entrances, right? Yeah. All right, I'll have to follow up on that sense. tomorrow. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, stone wall repairs. 
we did one section last year. We had, we had a consultant walk through with our capital folks and looked at the whole wall in terms of uh, budgeting to replace this whole wall. We or repair the whole wall. The, the intention is to keep the, the wall around the park. Um, the upper parking lot got removed because I mean, it was, it was in a state of deterioration that it wasn't fixable. It basically had to be torn right down to the sub base and rebuilt. And I mean, it was an astronomical cost. So the same thing with the, the walls around the park, they're in half decent shape. There's sections that are bad. So we're looking at addressing some of the worst sections first in smaller chunks. So you notice the entrance, uh, next to the fountain on Birch Road, we did that corner last year. Basically, they, they took that right down and, and built it back up. So every year, if we do like one bad section, like three to four years, we should have the worst of it done. And then we'll just be looking at an annual sort of a repointing project where, you know, the grout gets torn out and, and filled back in and, and caps get repaired and stuff. So the wall work will be more of an annual thing versus, hey, let's let's wait five to 10 years and try to save up $100,000 and do a boatload of work. It's It's been put onto a capital plan now where it's going to be an annual thing. Yeah, it makes more sense. So in 50 years time, yeah, it's not like, oh my God, the whole wall's got to come down. <laughs> yeah. In terms of the forest management plan, we had a three-year plan to, uh, to do thinning. Um, two phases were done. So in, in 1990 or 1990, yeah, sure. In 2019, mm -hmm. I believe a section was done. And in 2020, section two was done. 2021, section three did not get done last year. So section three, phase three, uh, the third 10 hectare section, we're hoping that that'll be done uh, this fall, this upcoming uh, September, October. So that tender should be going out this spring, hopefully. And that last section is the the section towards the northwest arm. So say from uh, from Cambridge Drive down to the arm, that whole section. And the only other thing I had in last operations update was winter operations. We were getting ready to go into winter operations at the time. And I, I supplied the information on HRM parks, snow and ice removal, just kind of the standards. I won't, I won't go into detail on that. That's available if anybody wants to look at the, uh, the map of the park and which roads we do do and which roads we don't do and kind of the general, uh, you know, how, how we do snow in the park. Um, that info is there. If anybody has any questions on that, you can certainly fire away. And other than that, in terms of an update, I mean, I'll speak to the next points about the kiosks and the benches, et cetera. But I guess the, um, I guess the last official part of my operations update is that this is my final operations update. I, uh, yeah. I've accepted a new position in uh, planning and development and tomorrow is actually my last day in parks. So. Congratulations, Steve. Congratulations. I think I'm. I think I'm the longest serving member on the committee. This is this is 14 years for me now. So wow, yeah. wow, congratulations. Yeah. I'd say I'd say boo, except that I know the job you're going to do in uh, planning. So yay, I guess. But, yeah, you know, I'll still get to see you. Congratulations, man. That's right. Not going far. That's good. Keep keep the good ones. All right. So you're, was there anything else, Stephen? Uh, uh, nope. That's it for the update, unless anybody's got any questions on that, I guess. Any questions? I don't see any hands. Okay. So 9.1.2 is our discussion on the park's kiosks. Um, yeah. So I guess, Stephen, you can, do you want to start off this one or? Yep. I can start it <laughs> off. Um, so back at um, item 6.1, when they talked about the uh, display cases and, and using it for Mi'kmaq um, commemoration or, uh, or whatnot, I was going to say probably not the greatest idea because the display cases are in rough shape. Anybody who's been in here knows. Uh, there's been a couple smashed out. Now we've got pieces of them in the back here. We've been trying to get prices on getting them fixed. And those are very expensive. The whole kiosk themselves, the outer skin is, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're rotten. They're, they need to be redone. So our capital yeah. folks have reassessed and um, the 
suggestion from capital right now and and our parks manager wanted to discuss it with the committee is removing the kiosks altogether, getting rid of them and just putting up maps like park id map signs saying you know here, here's a map of the park here's the icons for uh for signage put them on a standard uh park post i mean we do have decorative posts we wouldn't just make them look like you know two galvanized posts with a with a map on it i mean we could put up some some decorative posts but uh yeah just to uh to eliminate them because i mean it's going to be a big cost to to strip them right down and rebuild them again and then you know, we're going to be back doing this again in, in 10 years. I mean, they are literally only 10 years old. Yeah, I don't think they're ever waterproof either, were they, Stephen? They seem to they sort of take, take it no. Yeah, right from the beginning. Um, I'm just, I, I don't want to um, cut you off, Stephen, but I, I'll just jump in to, to say um, that's we should probably go back and, and uh, check the, the original park plan and see how there are, maybe you know this, Stephen, how they were intended to be used originally? That is in the plan. Off the top of my head, I could not tell you. Okay. Um, no, I, I was more curious if, if it was actually in there. So that's, they yeah. Were, that's, they were there, they, and they were suggested. Um, yeah. I think the whole interpretive wayfinding signage piece, I mean, that that can evolve. That can be, that can be changed. I don't think it said... 100 percent we got to have kiosks i know kiosks were there in in some yeah. form but um i mean the, the the overall intent was you know for them to be informational i mean we, we could get most of that information out with a map um and they were also designed for um certain areas of the park so all five kiosks that's what the uh the fish tanks were they had artifacts in them so the the, the beach yeah. had uh, something to uh, be commemorative of, of of the shoreline and then down by the arm there was the uh, the migma one and then there's one that had the forestry uh, stuff in them so kelly mciver with um, hrm cultural asset manager she she's got everything from all these kiosks or from all the fish tanks she's taken everything and uh, has got them all in storage uh, at municipal archives so you know, going forward with uh, with 6.1 earlier, you know, doing doing some commemoration for Mi'kmaq. I mean, all those artifacts and stuff still still exist. They're still there, so they can be you know utilized in talking with Kelly to to go forward with some kind of plan. So they haven't disappeared. There were also QR codes for a little while. See, I'm not sure what they were for. Um, I and some of them may actually still be be in the park. But is that a, a program that was that sort of came and went, or um, has just fallen by the wayside? Is that something might that perhaps could be an element of this? Um, do you know what I mean? The QR code, so it looks like a yeah, yeah, scrabbly looking Scrabble board. They were I don't know if there's any left because we replaced a lot of those uh, site tour markers. Yeah. I think we replaced. Mm. I was going to say we replaced them all. We probably never replaced them all, but we, we replaced 10 out of 12 or something like that. And the QR codes at the same time came off. Uh, manager of planning at the time said it's just well to get rid of them because they had statistics on them, how much they were actually being used. They were being hosted by. Uh, so you, you scan the Q cord, it, it, it takes you to a website. Yeah. And that website at the time when it was developed, we were paying for them to host these yeah. audio files and we were getting uh, metrics back from them as well to say, you know, how many times was the uh, Prince of Wales tower one scan? How many times was the, uh, the superintendent lot would scan? And uh, statistic wise, they weren't, they weren't really getting used. I mean, people for the most part, you know, regulars come in and walk the park. They don't really scan a code and listen to no, a, to an audio true. file. It would be, be more of a, a, a touristy type thing, I think. But they linked to, um, there was an audio tour put together way back when the comprehensive plan first started. First one I started here, so 14, almost 15 years ago, is pretty much when that started, when they got installed. And each one of those QR codes was a story told by somebody about that section of the park. So those <laughs> audio files still exist. And... I don't know if there's any link to them on, on Halifax website on the Point Pleasant Park page or not. I would have to check. 
but that whole tour, I mean, we've got brochures here. I've got, I've got a box of about a thousand brochures, uh, Point Pleasant Park audio tour, and it shows a map of the park and it shows all 12 or 13 of these spots. And um, there's a link to the actual website that you can, you can download it on your phone and walk through the park and listen to it. But the QR code, I guess, was just more or less an instant boom, and it's already on your phone automatically. So yeah, your feed didn't QR, know it existed. Yeah, I mean, it still exists. I guess a lot of people probably don't know it exists. You'd have to go to physically have to go to the Point Pleasant Park website to get the files and download them on your phone and come to the park. Right. Versus the QR code, I guess, was more or less a little bit. Hey, what the heck is that? Let me scan it and see. You know, the odd person yeah. did. I think there was like 200 a year or something like that the last time they checked they were getting yeah. scanned about 200 times a year so i mean in the grand scheme of things i don't I, I don't know how much we were paying for that service yeah is that a modern technology now is that you know my my daughter could probably invent something like that for oh, free yeah. right or you could host but, the files right there now on the post you know yeah. solar powered and yeah no web so, no web costs so yeah, so that might be worth re, re revitalizing in some form, hey? Maybe worth looking at where are the files being hosted now, and yeah. is there any way we could just let the public know, hey, come to the park website, look right here, boom, click that button, and all those files are going to be on your phone. Walk through the park with your headphones on and enjoy a tour. Yeah. And do you have any suggestions who to chase for the answers to do the files still exist? And <sighs> Well, I can uh, I can check the website to see if they're there. For some reason, I for some reason they used to be, but I, I'd have to I'd have to search the website, search the Halifax Parks and Rec website. I, I saw them a while ago. You yeah. did see them? Yeah. Well, some time ago, I did probably two years ago. Okay, well, there is yes, probably still there. I'll dig about and see if I can find it then. Um, right. Did you have anything else, Stephen, on the kiosks? Uh, no, that's it for kiosks. Now, so everyone, I just, um, just because, um, I'll let you know my opinion on this one. I think it's probably a good idea. I noticed they were leaking from the beginning. I always thought it was a shame that this stuff was, was, you know, sort of stuck there being held hostage, all, almost the artifacts. Um, so I think getting rid of them is probably a great idea. And the fact that everyone has a phone in their pocket now, something like QR codes or, you know, a web web address, you know, for more information probably does just as good a job. Point, point, point them somewhere down, down the shore. Um, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm just looking for input on, on that, the direction that we should take. Uh, with those kiosks, I agree that they're in bad shape and they need to be uh, either replaced, removed, or uh, I'm in favor of removal and putting in, you know, a wayfinding map that has all the information on it. I just, I guess I'm looking for a confirmation of that from the committee. Okay. So I'm, I'm in favor. Is this something we should formally um, vote on in some fashion. I see a hand up. Natasha, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just say, yeah, I think it's time for those to move on. They feel more like an artistic installment than a practical, pragmatic display case. And um, um, I don't think this means that we have to lose sight of what Brian has proposed and what, like there oh, are yeah, no. other mechanisms like yeah. we can, that can be figured out in time. In fact, when the kiosk proposal was presented, I just thought, oof, that's just not even a good uh, functional way of displaying um, things. And the question will come about too, is like, are artifacts appropriate to be just displayed on a case yeah. outside, you know? So yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um, I just wanted to say that I fully 100% uh, um, support uh, much better wayfinding uh, signage in the park. 
Any other hands up? So, Chris, I, uh, um, it sounds like every everyone's on board, but um, um, we we are, are in agreement that they're not serving the purpose they were intended to serve, um, and they're probably worn out and not worth the cost of replacing, provided um, something else is going in there in their stead instead of it just being torn out. And if anyone would like to add anything to that, please go ahead. Does that suit your purposes for now, Chris? Or did you need, did you do you like some um, more clarification? Is there anything specific you needed from us? No, that's good for now. Um, you know, I think we'll work towards uh, the removals and development of a, of a map. Great. And that would be fantastic if you, you could let us know when when stuff starts happening. It'd be exciting to hear. Okay, so um, unless anyone has anything more to say on the kiosks, I see no hands up. Let's move on to 9.1.3, which is discussion on dedication benches to the park. Um, and Stephen, maybe you can start us off on this one again. Yes, just give me one second. I lost my page. I just sent an email sure, out with a link to um, all those SoundCloud files as well. Hopefully everybody got the email. Thanks. And yes, they are on the, if you go to halifax.ca, Parks and Rec, Point Pleasant Park, all the information listed for the park, the self-directed guided tour is is one of the links there. So nice. it exists. It's still there. Um, so next was the, uh, benches. dedication the benches. benches, dedication benches to the park. So the thought is, um, I guess Point Pleasant Park in terms of upgrading, you know, this is one of the, uh, premier parks in the city, one of the regional parks of upgrading a lot of the, um, cans and benches and et cetera, et cetera. We looked at, um, you know, getting rid of all the, the the green benches, you know, along the shoreline. So along Sailors Memorial Way, uh, there's 40 some odd benches down there and so many picnic tables and cans. So we're looking at a multi-year initiative to kind of bring everything up to standard. Uh, on that note, there's a lot of people who are applying through our Gifts for Parks program who want to do memorial benches. Uh, in Point Pleasant Park. We do several all over HRM um, every year. However, Point Pleasant Park and the Public Gardens have been excluded from the Gifts for Parks or the, the Civic Parks program. So I guess the thought is, what, are the, what for discussion with the committee, what would the thought be on us allowing Point Pleasant Park to be part of the Civic uh, Support, pro, Civic Gifts for Parks essentially is what it's called. Uh, and allowing people to donate a bench, standard bench, um, and we just do say Sailor's Memorial Way. And the thought would be, um, you know, one for one. Here's a green bench. If you want to do a memorial bench, then, you know, the, that green one comes out and your brand new one goes in and it would be uh, all one style. And we're thinking it would be the, the ornamental black benches, the ones that you see down in the lower parking lot right now. So the entirety of Sailors Memorial Way essentially become an all uh, concrete pad with a decorative black ornamental bench. And each bench, if it's a, if it's a memorial bench to somebody, uh, it would have a little plaque and, 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 a, and an inscription on it. You see several of them in the park right now, mostly on the old green benches. But so I guess that's the thought uh, and up for discussion of the committee. What would you think if we, we, we went down that road and opened Point Pleasant Park back up to, uh, to the Gifts for Parks program? What, what's the downside? I don't see yeah, any downside. It's a great idea. I'm I'm curious where the money goes. Uh, what's it used for? So we have an administrator of the program already. Uh, she works over at Turner Drive. The, the The form is already online. So if anybody you know gets a hold of the committee or got a hold of me or went through the website and are like, I want to I want to put a bench in for you know, for my grandmother. Um, 
all signs point to this one this one uh, person who administers the program. They would work with the person uh, to get the funds, get the money. And essentially, you pay for the upfront cost of the bench. That's you know, the bench has to be ordered in with the plaque on it. Uh, we have somebody on standing off or a contractor who would come in and, and do the installation. And your money essentially is there then to, uh, you know, any any little upkeep like park staff, you know, if there was graffiti on a park staff would go down and clean off the graffiti or or if it needed painting. I, mean, I see it, it goes in, into the program. Yeah, 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 I, I yeah. Got it now. right. Sort of general upkeep maintenance. Yeah, no doubt. Everything needs maintenance. Um, yeah, I think it's a great idea too. Um, Natasha? Yeah, it sounds like a great idea. I'm just wondering, um, if, is there any context that we should benefit knowing about from the history on this in terms of like, why was Point Pleasant not included? Is there, is there something behind that that we should know about? <laughs> There is a section in the comprehensive plan um, you should look up and it kind of spoke to um, when the comprehensive plan was done, they did an inventory in here of, of everything and a lot of the memorial plaques and memorials themselves were inventoried and any actual memorial, I guess, to the Navy or to the Queen or something, those are more or less handled by our um, there's there's uh, like like Kelly McCarver with our cultural asset group. What we're talking about is the plaque in the middle of the woods to, you know, Fluffy, our dog who died three years ago. Right. And there's literally it's just a plaque in the woods. I mean, there's there's so many of these little things everywhere. And there's there's benches that were put in here 30 years ago that there's really not been much. You know, we need to replace the bench. The bench is, is rotten. It's gone. But it's like it's memorial bench. Like, do we do we get a new plaque yeah. created and put in like these? There's what no do you way do with the old one? Yeah. There's no way to track these people down. Either. Like there was yeah. no database from 30, 40 years ago when a lot of these plaques went in. So the comprehensive plan sort of spoke to a general discussion around going forward. Like, what are we going to do with these old plaques? Are we just kind of, kind of, you know, as as they die, do we just remove them and keep them in one central place, or you know, do we do we eventually allow, uh, you know, maybe one thing at a time, benches? Maybe we're not going to do memorial trees right now because everybody's going to want to put a tree, mm. Lord knows where, in the middle of the woods. You know, they used to go in the middle of the woods and have a sandwich somewhere. Now we want to put a memorial tree in there, right? Probably not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, so so I mean, read that read that section and see if there, there's there's nothing that jumps out on me right now, other than the committee was going to. Uh, take a look at it and maybe come to a, come to a, an agreement on if we would allow certain things to come back into the park. I mean, my recommendation is that's a win-win. Yeah. We do it just on one small area of the park, sales Memorial way, standardized furnishings. Um, you know, it's definitely an upgrade and uh, there's definitely, there's definitely a, uh, a cry from the public to, to put some in. Like, I don't think we're going to get 50 benches put in this year, but I mean, I certainly would think we'd get, you know, three, four, maybe half a dozen put in, put in per year. So, yeah, I mean, just, just look at that section and see if there's anything there that may jump out at you to say, whoa, we need a, we, maybe we need a bigger strategy before we mm -hmm. say yes to anything, but uh, nothing, nothing jumps out at me right now. Chris, go ahead. Yeah. I'd just like to add, I, I that is a great program. Um, I would like to, uh, just put it out there that if we want to open the whole park up to that or whether we want to have it in one specific area uh, is something that we should probably decide and the style of bench as well. There are a couple of different styles. I know in the plan, you know, it speaks about the old benches, the wooden bench with the concrete ends um, that we, phys we don't have those uh, anymore and we don't put those in parks anymore. So there's a couple styles, but the you know the black um, metal bench that is has been around seems to be uh, kind of a standard for the the major parks. Uh, so I that's the one I would go with, uh, recommend uh, just for looks. And the the other ones that are available are more of a like a wooden bench on a metal frame that's also bolted down. Um, we use those in other parks, like Shuby Park, for example, has the four by four wooden benches. So I think Point Pleasant would be better served with the, the more decorative uh, black metal. So 
So that's the only thing I guess I was just looking to find out if we should concentrate on one area of the park over the park as a whole and if those uh, black metal benches were preferred. I'm Oh shoot! Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. Carolyn, go ahead. Go ahead. I've been talking. So I will admit, I am like I am working on the the putting my hand up. So I apologize. <laughs> it's quite okay. Um, my family would say she's been working on it since she came out of the womb. But I swear, I still am. <laughs> um, is the first thing I thought of, and Natasha, you might know some or have some feedback on this. It, because it's so close to the ocean, the salt factor and everything, do does the material of the metal on the black ones pose any potential, like, will they wear faster? Or would that happen more so with the wood ones? That's all I thought about. Yeah, I, I think uh, the conditions down there are going to shorten the lifespan of any bench. Um, those black metal ones, the finish seems to stay on them fairly well. Uh, there's a number of them around the water uh, throughout different parks. Uh, you may want to have a look. I know there's a number of them, number of them around. So check it out and see what you think about the uh, the finish that's on them. In my mind, they would stand up as well as anything. I mean, most most of the area down behind Bishop's Landing has has them. If if that's easily accessible. For people to see. Um, Alex? Oh, no, sorry, Natasha. Did I skip the last um, time? Yeah, so to, to sort of answer Steve and Chris's question on this, um, I think your instincts about the, the type of bench um, is also uh, good and appropriate for it being such an urban park. Um, and so in terms of like um, the general overall uh, um, concept around placement, like, yeah, it probably does make some sense to have like sort of a um, sort of a designated area to start with to create more of this sort of cohesive um, Co connectedness, I guess, and sort of almost signal something more to come for the rest of the park. And I think, I mean, whatever what the 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 selection of area should bear in mind, of course, proximity to entrances and um, what serves um, the senior population and populations with disabilities, so that it's placed so that they feel comfort and safety in moving from the entrance to throughout, you know, a certain section of the park. So selecting areas where, you know, the grade is relatively flat and, and those kinds of things is, would be my suggestion to start with. Given, uh, I don't want to make presumptions, but also, you know, some of the people who donate these might be of an older set. They might want to visit the park of their loved one who's passed away, for example. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's valid. Alex? Oh, okay. I'm not muted. Okay. Hi. Yep. Uh, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, the, I Our family has one for my mom. It's it's over in Scotland and, and we go and see it when we're, when we're in, in Scotland. They're a huge draw for families and yeah. Sailor's Memorial Way, uh, I think you've hit it right on the, uh, on the head there. That is, I think, the place to start. High visibility, um, you know, a lot of people use that path. It's overlooking the harbor. Uh, it's just a, it's just a, a nice location. And I mean, I see the, as, as I'm sure you guys do too. I see these things everywhere uh, on bridges uh, over over here in in, in Dartmouth, uh, and on little uh, shelters that we have down here in Eastern Passage on the trail. People love to commemorate their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And I think opening this park up to that is, is really a great idea. Chris, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as part of the uh, application process for that program, 
there's typically a site meeting that happens with the people that are donating or wanting the dedication bench. Um, so it usually they would walk the site with with the person and pick a spot that best suits them. So a lot of times they would, if they're unable to move freely throughout the park, they would pick a spot, say closer to the parking lot or somewhere where they can easily access. Um, I guess another question that I would have is if we bring people in to look at dedications, uh, should it be a replacement of an existing bench only or should, if we're going to open it up so that they can put benches in other locations as well? Geez, I think that'd be <laughs> that'd be open to a, a can of worms. Um, I I I could see um, having sort of like o online a plot and say we have available such and such locations maybe, um, but if you just let people put them wherever, uh, that that probably get a little cuckoo. Um, the uh, the sailor I agree also with sailors memorial way there it's flat wheelchair accessible and and everything else so it seems seems like a good area to start with um did you and everyone seems to be on board with the metal the metal benches that was the other aspect to this do you feel do you feel like you got oh sorry sandra yes please go ahead yes um i was wondering what is the cost of these benches the different types and are any benches made of um, synthetic material that's more durable than wood or metal? Has that been looked at at all? Stephen or Chris, maybe? Yeah, so we do have uh, both the wood and the metal. We also, in the past, we've been able to get uh, uh, some composite built uh, benches that are made out of like the plas recycled plastic. Um, and they've been holding up fairly well. As, you know, we've got a number of those in, in different park sites now, some of them dedicated and some of them not. But that we are looking at, uh, I think having that as an option as well in the future for this program. Um, I know the, the metal bench, if I'm correct, it's around I don't know, twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars, something like that, for a, a bench with the concrete pad uh, installed with the plaque. What would that be compared to, like one of the wood wood ones with the concrete ends? So it had twice as much, maybe. Yeah, the wooden bench with the concrete ends we don't have anymore. We haven't put those okay. in place for probably five years. Um, but we do have one that's a uh, it's built out of four by four wood the seat in the back and it's on a galvanized metal frame mounted on concrete it, i think that it's uh it's about 1700 2000 so it's uh, a little less than the metal but it's a good option to look at but we would want to stick with one type in a certain park uh, just so for consistency and to get the look. Makes sense. Sandra, did that answer, answer your questions? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, oh, Brian, did you have your hand up or no? It was a glitch. Oh, wait, now it's up again. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. I can't hear you, though. Ugh, on mute. Yeah, just for information, Lake City over in Dartmouth, that nonprofit, do create the composite products. But I think that's already been answered by staff. So that, that covers that. Yeah, that's where we've been getting the ones that uh, are in place now. Yeah. This, uh, that's a nice heavy stuff, eh? It doesn't, that doesn't warp and sag. You see the Dalhousie, the Adirondack chairs. Yeah, let's yeah right. Lately, they're made from Lake City. Right. Good stuff. Uh, okay. So, Chris, did you get what you needed from us for that item? Yeah, I think so. So, the way I understand it is we're kind of on favor with putting the program into the park. We'll concentrate on uh, the Sailors Memorial Way area and we'll look at doing black metal benches on the concrete pad. Correct? 
Sounds good to me. Natasha? Yeah, just Chris, um, does the program mouse also extend to picnic tables? No, currently it's just benches and trees. So if we're not doing trees in the park, it would just be a, uh, a park bench. Good. I see no more hands up, so I think we can move on. I, Chris, just as long as you're clear, I, I, I think everyone's on board with um, the the three choices that you just outlined there. Um, the metal metal benches on Sailors Memorial Way. Um, so nine point one point four is we're down to schedule. Um, does anyone have any questions about the scheduling? I see no hands up. Where where was the schedule proposed? When, when uh, it went yeah. Out, uh, today in your agenda package, it was um, it's every it's bi monthly. So the next scheduled meeting, and it's generally the first Thursday of the month. So the meetings would be May 5th, July 7th, if required, September 1st, and November 3rd. And does anybody, any questions about the schedule? No. Um, so the, the motion would be that the Point Pleasant Park Advisory Committee approve the proposed 22, 2022 meeting schedule as presented. And this requires a mover and a seconder. Um, so I need a mover first. I so move, would, Brian. Thank you, Brian. And a seconder. I'll second that, I'll second that Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. And so for a call for the question, all those in favor say aye and opposed say nay. Aye. 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 Great. So that is carried. That motion is carried. Um, so 9.2 is committee members. Jill, maybe you can... You can uh, tell me what that one's about. Uh, I don't first. believe Sorry. there were any reports or anything no. from committee members. Oh, I see. Any, any new items? Yeah. Now there is. There was one thing. Um, I don't. It. It should have been on here, and it originally was. Uh, but Krista would be the one I have to ask about it. There's someone who I was put in contact with last year. Um, who's been trying to get information about the forts that are um, decomposing on the the uh, by on Sailors Memorial Way there um, near the beginning, and he hasn't been able to get any clear information from the city or from this um, this committee um, as to if anything's going to be done about it ever or uh, you know what. They're, and they're pretty bad. Like there's, you know, a, a huge um, eye beam collapsed out of the roof of one of them the other day. Um, so I'm, if quickly, um, I know it's not on, it's not in the schedule, but is Stephen or Chris, are you guys aware of, is there work being done to get rid of it? Or is it just gonna, it's, they're hoping it just sort of flattens itself over time. Well, I know when we did our walkthrough with Councillor Mason there a while back, uh, Parks Capital Group have money put aside this year um, to have a consultant come up with a draft plan, probably two or three options for the whole shoreline in terms of, you know, erosion and stabilization of the forts or getting rid of the forts. So I, I don't know that anybody has any concrete information right now, but I know that's going to be a part of that whole review and uh, the proposal or the options coming forward is gonna be, what are we doing with these forts? Are they savable? How much is it gonna cost to fix them? How much is it gonna cost to demolish them? Like I know there's gonna be all, all those options are gonna be looked at. So I, I, I don't know there's actually an answer at this time. Okay, and yeah, who, do you if, know if who, I, sorry, yes, go ahead. 
Jake, if I can throw in, um, yep. the Point Pleasant Park plan calls for entombment or removal. It doesn't call for repairing and maintaining. And, yeah. uh, you know, you can see the photo. But I think that's actually Stephen there uh, <laughs> on our walk around in the in the background. Yep. But I have a photo, if you go on my, my uh, political Facebook page there, of you can see the water going up inside one of the smaller forts. Like, they, like oh, yeah. if they were going to be saved, they need to be saved around 1960, right? Yeah. And, and they were not. So, yeah. They need to be taken down with a, with a backhoe, um, at least flattened, right? So, yeah, made, made safe even, for the kids. Yeah, made safe for the kids. That's it. Um, okay, I'll try and bring that in for formal um, addressment next time through. Um, so, I, I again, to... again, if I may, the, the, the parks planner, uh, the capital guy, Jeff Spares, who'd be leading that engagement, will be coming to talk to us, and then we can make motions. I, I would wait for the staff. To okay. Come. Okay. And you, he's going to be through next time, you, you figure? I, I, I don't know. Probably not until maybe next time, but probably the one after because the budget hasn't passed yet that has the money to do right. the consulting and the engagement and all that stuff. Okay. Thank you, Wade. Just gonna make a note for myself for that here. Okay, so the date of next meeting will be May 5th, 2022, that we've just approved. Um, and if unless there are any hands up, I think we can be let loose. Um, I need an motion for adjournment. No seconder is required. I so move. All right, thank you. And we are adjourned. I appreciate you, everyone's patience. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.